All right. All right. Welcome back to our master class. And I'm Pastor Stan Hood at Southeast Seventh day Adventist Church. We are, this is an advanced class for believers, for those who want to dig a little deeper. We're still on lesson one, but this is part five hermeneutics. We're going to have a little technical class tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you uh, for the ability to come together as a family and discuss things. We ask, Lord, that your spirit guide and lead us, give us wisdom that we don't have and understanding we're not capable of uh, through your grace and your mercy. And not so that we can brag or boast, but so we can glorify your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Y'all see that little thing popping up on my screen? A little, let's see, oh, there's somebody else coming in. All right. So we have been going through a long way through lesson one, but it is extremely important that we understand the beginning. Uh, if we don't understand the beginning, nothing else is going to fall in its proper place. Tonight, we're on part five with this big, long word called hermeneutics. And we're going to talk about what that means and why it matters. All right, let's get started. All right, um, here is the question that is most often asked. What difference does it make? Why do we need to know all this stuff? If I confess with my mouth, and believe with my heart, I shall be saved. The best way that I can explain it, Brother Parker, is most of us, when we see a nice car, we say, wow, I would love to have that car. I, want, I don't want that car to take it apart. What do I want that car for? I want to drive it. <laughs> I want to drive that car. And I, I want to see myself driving it. Every time I pass by a mirror, I might slow down to see myself driving that car, right? And, and because that is, a, would y'all agree? That's a nice car, right? And, and so let's take another look at it. Some people, maybe not a lot of people, they don't just want to know uh, where they can go in the car. They want to know what's under the hood. They want to know how the car works. Uh, and I know that that's a minority of people. Most people don't care what's under the hood. It'll all take care of itself. I just want to ride. And they can. They can ride and enjoy themselves to the highest. They can sing songs and, and high five each other all the way down the Audubon as they ride in that nice car. But if you don't learn a little bit about the car, right, this is going to happen to you sooner or later. <laughs> sooner or later, you're going to run into something that's going to have you broken down on the side of the road. Now, whether or not this is a big deal is based on how much you know about the car. Doesn't that make sense? The Bible is exactly the same way. It is wonderful to believe, and it ain't nothing wrong to just say, Lord, whatever you say, I trust it. If you say it, I'll do it fantastic. Uh, but I encourage everyone to go a little bit deeper. Everybody doesn't have to go as deep as me, but you can go a little bit deeper because the deeper you go, the more confidence you'll have in God. And when you get stuck on the side of the road, you'll know how to get yourself out because you know God intimately as a friend, as a father, as a Lord, as a savior, and not just somebody who gives you a ride when you ask for it. Scripture is meant to be understood. Does anybody believe that? I hear somebody. Amen. Amen. Yes. Scripture is meant to be understood. Yes, indeed. And, and, and when we take any other approach, you will find teachers and preachers avoiding whole chapters and whole books of the Bible because they don't have the slightest idea on how to understand it. So how do they deal with it? They don't deal with it. 
right? And, uh, and that can be extremely problematic. That can be very problematic if we don't deal with how God intends for us to understand scripture. And so if we agree upon that, uh, we can keep rolling. But I do understand, you know, I did get some feedback about our previous lessons. Some of them were very good, but one or two was like, hey, I don't see the point of going that deep. And what I would say to those people is, maybe this is not for you. Ain't no problem. Going deep isn't for everyone. Going deep is for those who are called by God to go deep. Uh, and it's nothing, we're not dealing with a lot of salvation issues. We're just dealing with how the Bible is composed and how we are to look at it. Here, here's a, uh, what we're going into tonight called hermeneutics. The difference between a casual knowledge of the word and a clear understanding of the word can be found in this sentence. Anybody want to read this sentence? Woman without her man is a savage. Woman without her man is a savage. What do y'all think about this sentence? Anybody? What do y'all think about this sentence? It's belittling her, I think, the woman. Think so? Oh, okay. Well, I guess, yeah. I, guess I, you think, mm -hmm. I think what it's saying is, is that woman without her man is a savage. Is, she is not uh, accomplishing the purpose that God intended for her to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I see iPhone with a hand raised there. Go right ahead. Yeah. That sounds like the woman is going to be totally confused and in total disarray and going in each and every kind of way, doesn't have a set pattern in which she should be focused on. And then when you think as the word savage back in the days of cowboys and Indians and natives, that term savage was always referred to someone who was wild and loose. <laughs> you know, yeah, you heard a good point. The, that's a savage. That's right. Know? So <laughs> man or woman that was a savage. Yeah, I, so I'm with you. It's it's a it's a demeanor. Whichever mm -hmm. way you look at it. Yeah. Not true, but it's a it's a, <laughs> yes, it's a demeanor. Indeed. Yes indeed. Uh I see a D down there. Is that just Diane? Uh yes, it is. Oh, go right ahead. But this is a question. It's not a statement. Woman without her man is a savage. It's like um, it's it's yeah. <laughs> it's not it's not saying that that is. They're wondering is she a savage without her man? So I don't know if we can treat it as a a statement or if we just should ponder if we believe this or not. Mm, good observation, yeah. Sister, Sister Hood. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm with Sister Diane. It's not a statement. It's a question. So are you asking a question or are you making a statement, Pastor Hood? So I, just, what are, I don't want to give my thoughts. I want to hear what y'all think. And then I'll... I so will what was your it. original... Um, what you do said, you what think do we of, think What about, do you think of this? What's on the screen? What do you think of it? Said the, it be, if a woman doesn't have a man, would she be considered uh, untamed or, or not able to manage on her own without a man. That's what I see in the same, in the, the yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the question, is she, does she have value without a mm -hmm. man? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Brother Parker? I have to apologize. I read the, the sentence and I did not use the exclamation mark at the end of it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. No problem. Dr. Pam, this is a classroom. It's all good. <laughs> well, woman without. Her man is a savage. 
So if she's without her man, something's wrong with her man, not her. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> All right, see another iPhone. Is that Sister Veronica? No, that would be me. No, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, that's an unfounded statement as a question. As mm -hmm. a question, that's not true. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Mm -hmm. She's not. She's not a savage. Mm -hmm. You know, she's just without a partner. But that's that doesn't make her. You know, less woman. You know. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Well, this is like the car that I showed you uh, in the beginning. Um, this is the blind spot. If without uh, knowing how to rightly divide the word, you can be taken in a totally different direction than where the word is going. And innocently, just like tonight, innocently, nobody's looking to be wrong. You're trying to decipher it on the surface. Okay. Now let's put it in. Oh, Dr. Pam, go ahead. Oh, I see it. You see it? Go ahead. Uh -huh. Woman without her, man is a savage. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. In, in scripture, the way scripture was written, there was no punctuation. So the context had to be figured out based on what's around it. And so imagine how reckless a preacher or a teacher could be by taking text out of context can make it mean whatever they want it to mean. And I don't think God is pleased with that, do you? Nope. Hey, there it is in proper context. Woman, without her, Man is a savage. And here's the last part. If there is no punctuation, then the question mark itself is assumed. You see? So in order to figure out if this was a text, in order to figure out what it means, you have to read before it and after it. And you have to ask yourself some other questions. What kind of questions would you have to ask yourself to figure out if you are reading this correctly. Who's saying it? Yeah. And why? <laughs> and yeah. why? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so good point, Audrey. So it makes a difference if Nebuchadnezzar is saying it or if Daniel is saying it. Doesn't it make a difference? <laughs> yes. It makes a difference if Herod is saying it or if Jesus is saying it. Right, we don't have to pay no attention to Herod, but we do have to pay attention to Jesus. What's some other questions you have to ask to proof a text? Any text, not just them. Just this is not a text. It's just an example for for discussion. But but what other questions would you have to ask to figure out whether or not you see a text correctly? Going back to elementary school, who, what? when, where, and why. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Any, anybody else want to throw anything else in there? <laughs> okay. Is it consistent with what I know about scripture? For instance, uh, God is no respecter of persons. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so before I put the punctuation in, you know, that may be a proof text to see if this is what I think it is. So, so if it doesn't agree with the scriptures I'm sure of, then either I'm looking at it wrong or it is written wrong, one or the other. Okay. All right. So uh, this is what we call hermeneutics. And this is why it is important. Okay. Uh, what I'll be using tonight, uh, and I'll try not to keep y'all as long as I did last time. I think I got carried away last time. <laughs> but, uh, I'm using biblical hermeneutics and Adventist approach. It's edited by Frank M. Hassel. 
but there are lots of Adventist scholars who contributed to this publication. I got it in front of me right now. And that little exercise came out of this book, book on hermeneutics. So I've left it up there. I'm not asking you to go buy this. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, I was thinking about making it a gift for those who finished the master class. Wouldn't that be a nice gift? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, be, be a nice gift at the end because it is very thorough and you can look at things, especially from an Adventist approach on biblical hermeneutics, okay? All right, so let's talk about what hermeneutics is. Over the course of time in Christian history, rules and procedures for reading the Bible correctly have emerged to guide the reader. So over the course of all these, all these years since the, yeah, no man. the scripture had been written, uh, that's how we come to these rules, okay? Uh, I've given you one rule over and over again. A thing can never mean what it never meant. That is an example of biblical hermeneutics. Okay. If I were to give it its proper, proper name, I would say sits in Laban. <laughs> A thing can never mean what it never meant. In other words, uh, Acts chapter 10, when Peter is told to rise and eat, it cannot mean that Peter was told to eat unclean foods. That's an example of a thing can never mean what it never meant. The same God who said, if you touch the pig, I won't touch you, is not going to tell mm -hmm. Peter to have a pork chop. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. So when he says rise and eat, now I got to dig a little deeper and try to figure mm -hmm. out what's going on by asking those questions that we just asked a minute ago. Okay? It comes from... And wait a minute, are you talking to me? Oh, okay, I'm just gonna mute you there. All right, hermeneutics, the word itself comes from the Greek verb, it's a verb called hermeneuin, which basically means to interpret, translate or explain. That's all hermeneutics is, it's nothing to be, uh, in, you know, uh, what do you call that? Intimidated by, it's, it's just, another way of saying interpret or translate or explain. Here's Luke 24, 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Here is Jesus using hermeneutics. What do you think about that? Isn't that cool? Right? Here's Jesus using hermeneutics. Anybody know where what's going on in this particular scripture. Oh, well, you all do. We have a name for it. We call it the road to Emmaus. <laughs> Remember that? Oh, yeah. It's after the resurrection and some followers are discouraged and Jesus joins them on the road. Beautiful oh. picture of God coming alongside us. Uh, he wants us to understand. Remember, that's how we started. Mm -hmm. He wants us to understand. And this is a good example. He didn't have to do this. I mean, look at what he'd already done. My goodness, he gave his life for us. He could have went on. But no, even on the individual level, God wanted those two disciples to understand. And he took as much time as he needed to help them understand. All right. Any, any thoughts on that before I move on? Okay, very good. So he began where? At Moses. You see that? Mm -hmm. He began at Moses. What does that mean? He began at, uh, at oh, oh, Brother Parker, go ahead. He began at Moses means he began at the beginning. Moses okay. uh, and the things that Moses did and the um, how can I say it? The incidents that occurred in Genesis to Deuteronomy all pointed to him. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Deacon King, man. It means to me that he began with Moses means that when uh, Moses took on 
the leadership that God sent him to do, set uh, people free and bring them into the promised land, that that teaching started with that extension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sister Audrey. Uh, would you say that uh, his law was written and given to, to the Israelites at that time? Uh, he spoke to mankind, the, the father, and also with Moses, uh, was his uh, mediator between him and the and the children of Israel, the Jews, and and since the disciples were Jewish, that was their lineage, so they could relate to Moses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. That's true too. Now let's look at it. Let's take a closer look at it. And beginning, which Brother Parker brought out. <laughs> at Moses and all the prophets, what reference would they have for this? It would be the law and the prophets. Moses is called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And the prophets, both minor and major, would be the other books um, of the Old Testament, whether no matter what genre it was, whether it was history, major prophets, minor prophets, or whatever. Um, he walked them through what they knew as the Bible then and showed them how it was him all along. You see? So when they use this kind of language, they mean the Bible that they had, which was basically the Old Testament. Okay? All right. Let's go. Let's again remind you of something here. Uh, this is the goal for those who are just coming in. Uh, we started with the people from the Fresh Start class, so there may be people who didn't get the beginning of this lesson. It, 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 you know, we gave the goals of why we are doing this. Uh, we want, first of all, we want to know God better for ourselves. That's the first thing. And then we want to have complete confidence in him. If we're going to share God, we must have complete confidence in him, all right? Uh, whenever we encounter anybody, we're not trying to debate, but let's keep it real. Every encounter is a spiritual encounter, and it's my God versus your God. That's what it is, plain and simple, all right? So we talked about this in the first lesson. You can go back to it in part one. Uh, we talked about he is the self-existent one. These are keys to understanding scripture. He is the mover who is unmoved. He does not have a creator. He does not have a beginning. He is the tetragrammaton. What does that mean? It means four letters, okay? Uh, in Hebrew, it would be Y-H-W-H, or uh, from a Greek point of view, we would probably say L-O-R-D but none of these are a complete explanation of his name or his origin. Most of the time when the Bible is speaking about God, it's usually giving an attribute of God, uh, uh, something that he's done or something that he's known for. Uh, to be honest with you, we can't be completely sure what his name is. And, uh, and I, I believe that God, uh, wants us to see him at, from more than one aspect. He, want us, he wants us to try him and, and uh, see if what he says is true. And so uh, I talked about Yeshua versus Jesus and all of that, uh, uh, but I want to affirm that God knows who you're talking to, all right? Uh, in the beginning, uh, time is instituted for our benefit. We talked about the solar system and the orbiting and the, uh, the, the tide system uh, of the moon and the days and the months and the years and all of that. That is for us because God does not need time because he is not expiring. <laughs> you know, it is man who starts to expire once he's born, but God does not need time. And so when God says he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, uh, there are no seams in that. He can see forward, backwards, and still deal with what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. So that's the God mm -hmm. that we want to know, 
Okay, so let's have a little class and then at, at great risk <laughs> to be at this time of night, we're going to have a little class. I'm not trying to make it very deep. I just want to explain to you why people have so much trouble and so many misunderstandings about God, about the Bible. This is how it happens. It's called presuppositions. And um, in an easy way, it's not an exact one-to-one, -one, but assumptions that could be used. Uh, and these presuppositions uh, are had by everyone, whether you're religious or not, everyone believes something and everyone assumes something. And encountering God, we either affirm our beliefs or we have to overcome our beliefs. So presuppositions, talking about hermeneutics tonight, the number of beliefs that we accept without support from other beliefs, arguments, or evidence. Can anybody give me an example of what a presupposition would be? Mm. You know, quiet. I'll give you one to start it out. The sky is blue is a presupposition. Okay, Sister Diane. Mm -hmm. Well, I was wondering if like value systems are presuppositions. So uh, yeah. what you grew up and what, uh, I don't know. Um, if you want to make it in this world, you have to, it has to be a dog eat dog world. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a big part of this field is uh, a lot of what you believe is based on what part of the world you're born in. So that's a good point. Uh, Brother King, man. That God is everywhere present at the same time and still, like what you just said earlier, be experiencing in the present now. Yeah, that is a presupposition. Uh, would you want some extra credit? <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me why that's a presupposition? Because it's something like the definition. I had no idea until you presented it. And I said, mm -hmm. okay. You, mm -hmm. you made it so wonderfully simple that it's, like you said, an assumption that we make that we accept as a fact mm -hmm. and move without any um, reference or uh, knowledge of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did I get my extra points? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. I'm going to expound on it shortly, but I want to, to, to walk it slow, okay? Because when we start having this kind of conversation, people either go to sleep or their eyes glaze over. I don't want to know all that, you know, <laughs> but it's going to have a point at the end. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Brother King, man. Uh, all right, let's move on. Here is a biblical view of that, Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And you see the presupposition in this. Okay, I'm gonna share it with you in a minute. Give you the different levels first. Just kind of take this in. You might have to watch this one back. There are three different levels or four different levels to this. There is the macro level of presupposition, or you can call it assumptions. It's the broad view of God. This one can be subtle and dangerous because it's based on all that we have been exposed to, even if we don't believe it. Isn't that deep? <laughs> all thoughts about God, pantheism, deism, classical theism, etc., Everything that we've ever heard about gods or a god never leave us. They're in the back of our minds, and it tries to influence what we think about our god. Okay, any, any questions about that? I'm taking long explanations and trying to make them short. Sister Diane, go ahead. I don't know what pantheism is. It's a belief that God is in everything, in the trees, in the grass, in the water, oh. in everything. Mm -hmm. Like India, Hinduism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. All right. I don't hear nobody talking. I must have done good. Okay. So after the macro level, and this is all of us, you know, there's the meso level of assumption. Beliefs developed by what is possible in nature. Human nature cannot maintain doctrines like immortality of the soul or supernatural activity. But it is at the meso level that we have our first doctrine. Does that make sense to anybody? Let me give you a Amen. meso level assumption. What goes up? What's the end of that? Must, Must come down. down. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if you hit your head on that table, it's not going to move. Break. Right. <laughs> yeah, or break. Right. These are meso level beliefs. All right. All right. Uh, and, and so, so these beliefs have to be overcome with some aspects of faith, but it doesn't mean it's out of harmony with faith. Let me give you another meso level belief that's in harmony with faith. If a man doesn't work, he doesn't what? Eat. Yes. So you can see that in the natural, right? But you also see it in scripture. Amen. Do y'all see this thing popping up on my screen? <clears throat> oh, okay, good. Okay. <laughs> All right. I don't want to mess up the um, shower, I hope. I don't want to mess up the recording. Okay, so here's how we look. This is our brain. <laughs> Can anybody take a crack at explaining this? Somebody's talking about the future. Don't make up Take a shower, right? Click. Can somebody want to take a shower? We can hear you. you got the okay, I guess we all gonna participate in your conversation. It was it was eight dollars. I don't know who that is. So we got two for nineteen eighteen dollars. Oh, right, I found them. I, I had to find them. <laughs> All right. Well, that was fun. Uh, can somebody take a crack at how this is our brain? All right, anybody? Sister Diane. Well, I'll take a crack at it. Yeah, this um, is class. You can't be wrong. But that's right. You mean you gotta take a <laughs> risk, right? You know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh true belief, true belief, true belief. The our head is full of what we think our beliefs, our true beliefs, and they're validated by by smaller or consistent beliefs to that true belief. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, like, I believe that um, some people are selfish. Let's just say that. And then I can confirm it by seeing selfish acts in my work field or, mm -hmm. or something like that. And then um, another, belief, another true belief could be um, it's good to brush your teeth. And that could be affirmed by knowing that I can get cavities. So I don't know. <laughs> I'll just try it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was pretty good. Uh, a, a better way to say that first one, it was selfishness, is that you start with a presupposition that everybody is selfish. You see, and then that your experience sense. seems to confirm or disassemble your belief, one or one or the other. But we're, we're talking about more of absolutes now. That's why I gave the one about what goes up must come down. You know, so yeah, but yeah, that's pretty good. All right, Brother Parker. I would go back with uh, and try to make a point with history. Mm -hmm. Man believed he could fly. Mm -hmm. And he kept trying and he kept trying. And finally he began to fly. So he believed that he can fly just like even today. Man believe they are flying, but they're mm -hmm. not. They're in a machine. Mm -hmm. That so, man so, himself is not flying. Right. Right. I'm sorry. I thought you were done. Okay. So, so how did man get from failing to succeeding in flying? Believing he could invent something that could get him up there. Oh, so what's the process of inventing something? 
believing that you can do it. Okay. Well, you got to go one more step after you believe it. You got to do what? Accomplish it. Yeah. And, and how does that take place? Try and error. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Trial and error. So, so then in your excellent example, Brother Parker, some of these beliefs in these circles are true and some of them are false. And the only way to know for sure is to test them. You know, in your, in your example, people tried to make wings out of feathers like a bird and jump off of stuff. It didn't go well, <laughs> right? but they could scratch that off their list, right? Uh, Dr. Pam, you, you change your mind? Go ahead. Yeah, you guys already said what I was gonna say. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, well, you could take it further if you like. We, we, have a, we have a phrase we call that. We have a name for that of trial and error. Go ahead, Dr. Pam. Right. So a true belief is something that you actually have observed mm -hmm. and know it to be true. So it's like knowledge. And then out of that true belief, something that you have actually observed, then comes the trial and error. And error. Then you come mm -hmm. to something that, okay, I believe this because you tried it and it became true. But true belief, you actually know it, you've seen it, you know that it can happen. Mm -hmm. And then the other beliefs come off of that, but like you said, they're not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, Sister Diane, go ahead. Well, it seems to me then that the arrow should be going in two different mm -hmm. directions. Oh, go true, ahead, true Diane. Belief. <laughs> so if yes. you, have a, you have a true belief you're, you're either trying to figure out if it's true and then that'll confirm an outward arrow but some of the inward arrows from the beliefs on the outside would say no it doesn't confirm a true belief yeah you know? yeah. yeah so it seems like the arrows can't just go in one direction on this that's right remember i said this is our brain does any of us know everything for sure mm -mm. no but we begin with a assumption. And in my brain, that assumption is a true belief, but it may not be. <laughs> and then through my observation, my trial and error called the scientific method, right? We, we find out whether we were right or wrong and these things affect other things. Now they may be to lesser or greater degrees, right? Uh, uh, for instance, I know that I need water and food or else I'm going to be ill and maybe even die, right? But somebody may test that and say, I need Coke and cookies. I need Coca-Cola and cookies. And guess what? That's not the same as water and real food. But, we, but I might believe that I know people who don't drink water. Anybody know anybody don't drink water? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they believe that since I have not died yet, it's not killing me, <laughs> right? And soon they're gonna find out if that is a true belief or not. So it goes back and forth around in a circle, okay? And so these things are what we have to overcome to believe in God and to believe God. Some things are in harmony with, with what God says, and some things God says are beyond our human capability. For instance, we've been talking about creation. In, in the natural, that is beyond our human capabilities. Wouldn't you agree with that? Six days, the Lord made heaven and the earth, and he scooped up some dirt and made a man, and then he stuck his hand in that man and made a woman. <laughs> right? So through my observations, in life and my experience, can we use that word now? In my experience is telling me that is not plausible because I've seen how people come into the world, right? And I've never seen anybody make a planet or create, make it habitable, right? So, so then let's get to this level called the micro level of presumption, presuppositions or assumptions. Now here it is, your personal belief that occurs when you encounter the text. What text? The Bible. 
your personal beliefs when you encounter the Bible is that there are two things that have to somehow come in line and you got to reckon that you got to reconcile it did God make the sun stand still <laughs> did Hezekiah get 15 more years you know did Jericho fall by walking around it the text now is confronting you see do y'all see what I'm saying the text is confronting remember Jesus talked about the kingdom uh, and violence and force this is kind of what he means, right? Not so much of going out and, and looking for demons to slay, but your mind has to be made new, all right? Your mind has to be made new in order to deal with how the text is confronting you, all right? Y'all still with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we have these different levels of how we think, and all of this is a part of teaching hermeneutics. Okay, so my, I've encountered the text and though it is influenced by macro, meso, and micro, we just talked about it, it can't dismiss that there's something more to what we physically see. So even though my whole life I have uh, operated by a set of rules through experience, this time of year, I know I need to have a jacket right? <laughs> that would be in the meso part of it, right? Uh, the, my years have taught me that the seasons require me to dress differently. I don't need to wait now for the seasons to change. I know how to anticipate and prepare for them because they've taught me all my life how to dress for them, right? And however, the Bible tells me uh, that God um, is holding back the four winds of strife, that there are powers and principalities of the air. It told me that the devil brought a storm and killed Job's children. You see, that does not fit within my experience. And then as I go forward and I live my life, there are things that I can't explain. Can somebody give me some examples of things that you can't explain in your life? I heard y'all doing it in the previous study. <laughs> Anybody just pop in and give me that? How the mind works. You can't explain that. Very good. Very good. Very good. And they've been trying, haven't they? They've been trying forever. Yes. And we've learned how to treat it, how to help it but we can't make one, right? Very good. Anybody got another one? How does uh, tornadoes originate? Oh, ah. can that be explained? They haven't, they haven't been able to. Oh, okay, Sister Diane. Uh, the one I gave was you can't figure out why, how a seed works, how God makes a seed become a tree. Excellent. Excellent. We can observe it. We can nurture it. We can benefit from a seed, but we can't necessarily duplicate what God has done. We can only take what he's done and manipulate it, but we cannot duplicate it. Uh, that's Sister Parker. I, w I would listen to everybody else. I would say, when we sleep at night, how we dream. And some dreams mm. we never remember, but we mm. dream. Mm. Good point. We got a whole study on that coming up at some point if we ever get out of part one. Okay, I think that was Brother Parker I saw next. Or was that Brother King, man? I don't know. That might Brother have been Parker. Brother King, man. I just raised my hand. I'll let him go first. Okay, go ahead, Brother King, man. How our heart keeps beating without stopping wow. no matter what we do. Wow, very good, very good, excellent, amen. Uh, How Parker. and when an earthquake will hit. Hmm, hmm, wow. We can measure them, but we can't tell when they're gonna hit and how hmm. they're gonna hit. Where? Wow. And where? All right, well, I hear you back there, Sister Parker. You help that man out. 
<laughs> Dr. Pam, go ahead. <laughs> you can't explain how you could put a sperm and an egg together and make a human being. Very good. Very good. And, and look at the probability rates of that. I mean, my goodness. Um, if, if this all were random, it would be a mess, you know? Uh, the, a, a woman being able to carry that baby to term and deliver, deliver a healthy baby uh, is definitely the hand of God. Sister Audrey, go ahead. The instinct that animals are given from, from birth when they're born, that they know what to do. Right, right. Like the how instinct. some animals, they just get up and walk right from the beginning. That's amazing. And then some are just abandon their kids. Like, I'm out, I've done my job. And the kids <laughs> know what to do. I love about the turtles going out to the sea. Things like right. that. The penguin migration. Very good. Right. Brother Parker. Another thing is, and Sister Argy brought this to my mind, how an animal can sense danger before it happens. Yeah. 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 For sure. For sure. All right. Where does the wind come from and where does it go? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one Jesus used in John uh, 3, I believe it was, with Nicodemus. He said, you can't see it, but that don't mean it's not there. <laughs> All, right. All right. So let's take a look at the text. Luke 17, 6. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed. Hmm. If you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it should obey you now is that an incredible statement or not wow hmm. so here's the here's the last one it's called biblical presumptions well, presuppositions i'm gonna put two words together Biblical presuppositions, assumptions that are faith, faithful to the scripture. So uh, what's the difference between those other ones and this statement? There's one clear thing right in the first sentence. I'm setting hey. aside what I think. <laughs> the scripture has, is held as the ultimate truth. Mm -hmm. It is entirely possible to maintain what was found through the macro, meso or meso, and micro that is in harmony with the Bible. Remember earlier, I used what goes up must come down. If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. That's all, you can find plenty of things that are in harmony uh, with the Bible. You don't have to choose one or the other in many cases. However, should you have to choose one or the other? Biblical, presuppositions always chooses the scripture over my experience or what I think. It's called the epistemic circle, right? It is the belief. Remember Paul said, we look through a glass darkly. It is belief, it is the belief that even if I don't understand it, God means it for my good and I'll understand it when. I'll understand it better by and by. by. Right, the epistemic circle. And so this is where we live once we are born again. How we know, this is a definition of it, how we know uh, is controlled by the nature of the object which is revealed through seeking to know it. That's a long way of saying that God is not physically available to us, but he reveals himself through his word. And so, when we are born again, we live in this circle. Now, there is a lot of criticism. Like if you go and Google it right now, you'll find uh, 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 psych psych uh, psychology and physics, uh, those people who are, are experts in that, you'll find them criticizing this. Because back in the Renaissance age, you know, with France, uh, the, that, that revolution, uh, it started a new era that said, if you cannot see it, then don't believe it. If you cannot personally prove it, then don't believe it. And I don't believe that is of God, okay? It, it, we would never had that airplane you brought up, 
uh, brother, I think it was Brother King Man, Brother Parker, one of y'all. Okay, so this is what we look like now. All of that clutter is gone. Okay. Why do you think this is aligned the way that it is? Yeah, I said, mm, mm, that's all I hear. <laughs> <Just bang. laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> well, in education, it's called a Venn diagram. And when you put the two, when you put truth and belief together, they both share knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Brother Parker. Sister Dan basically said what I was going to do without the education part. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, first she of all, remain true to who she is. Go ahead. <laughs> Go, ahead. Go ahead, Brother Parker. Go ahead. Just like when um, Pilate asked Christ, what is truth? Mm -hmm. He didn't believe in truth. So mm -hmm. he did not have the knowledge that whom he was talking to was the king of the Jews, just not at the time that he stood there to be crowned as king. Truth leads you to belief because you have found out, using your example, what goes up must come down. Mm -hmm. If you jump off a building, you're going to hit the ground. That's mm -hmm. truth. And you've seen people that have done it commit suicide, so you believe it. Now mm -hmm. you have knowledge. Mm -hmm. and if you jump off a building, mm -hmm. you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't follow that one up, Brother King Man. Go right ahead. <laughs> there is basically three kinds of truth. Mm -hmm. And it has been said that if you believe something long enough, it becomes true to you. So the mm -hmm. three types of truth is my truth, your truth, and the truth. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And that doesn't so mean that it's. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is truthful. Yeah, that is true. That is very true. Uh, Sister Diane, the educator, is coming back. Go oh, jeez. Right yeah. <laughs> I get myself into trouble. No, let's, uh, let's say uh, Jesus is the truth. We mm -hmm. have the belief. And together, we both have knowledge. Hmm. I didn't look at it that way. All right. Thank you. Thank you. OK. I might steal a little bit of that. All right. Anybody else? Okay. But knowledge, is, knowledge is still relative, actually. Mm -hmm. If you, you have to, the intersection between belief and truth, and then you have knowledge, then what exactly is knowledge? Mm -hmm. If it's intertwined with belief, and then there's truth in it, it's still relative. Mm-hmm. Is that really mm -hmm. the whole truth and nothing but the truth? No, well, that is a, a astute observation. Uh, you're acknowledging that truth and belief are overlapping. You know, if you go back to our first view of our brain, what did we have? We had beliefs all over the place, right? And we had what we believed to be, what we knew, like, I know this is true. I might be wondering about this other thing, but I know this thing is true. And we had those in the center circles. So why does it look different now? Right? It's, this is simplified down now. And so what is this trying to tell us? Okay, y'all done got quiet on me. Well, yeah, knowledge is, is relative also. It depends on oh, yeah. you. You know, yeah. so you got cultural things that come into play, your worldview that comes into play, a lot of things that come into play. It's not absolute mm -hmm. knowledge or absolute truth. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Brother, br Brother Mike, go ahead. I'd have to say the truth is Jesus. Belief is us mm. and knowledge is God. Oh, man, you all, was almost there. You almost had it, Mike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 i was like well, yes yes right at the end there uh brother parker go ahead let me give you a i heard go ahead go ahead 
I, I want to give y'all a text to look up. First Thessalonians 521. And then we will uh, uh, just look that up. And then that'll give you the answer. Brother King, man. Oh, 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 Parker, go ahead. You want to say something first? Go ahead. The thing about the, um, the statement is that there are universal laws that mm -hmm. we know that is the truth. And an example of it is, is that too much sunshine will burn you and mm -hmm. too much water will drown you. Yeah. So if we violate these truths, then that is a whole different paradigm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a country song there, Brother King Man. <laughs> too much sun will burn you, and too much water will drown you. Well, yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is definitely the truth. <laughs> Anybody Which, look up that text? Yes, I have it. Okay, go right ahead. Test all things, hold fast what is good. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Remember, I said that we are now born again. And so this whole diagram is cleaned up now and it's boiled down to something really simple. Brother King Man, go ahead. Um, I left my hand back up. Oh, but okay. I'm a little up by accident, but I'll take this opportunity to acknowledge what um, Audrey just revealed through the scripture that you had us to pull and that it says, test all things. It says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good as an example of that. Mm -hmm. Very good. But the thing Very is, good. what is true? The Bible says, thy word is true. God's yeah. word is true. What is the absolute truth? Teach on it. Teach. All right, sister, a uh, king man. I mean, sister Pamela, you you <laughs> took what I was going to say. Yeah, love it. Love it. You jumped yeah. in there ahead of me. Remember in the beginning of this, I said that we bring some portion of all beliefs that we've been exposed to, to the table. Once we've been exposed to them, whether we believe them or not, they are there. For instance, and you walking down the street, you know you don't have to worry about splitting the pole, but you don't split it just in case. <laughs> don't step on a crack, break your mama back, whatever it is, you know. <laughs> These things, we may laugh at them and think they're silly, but do they go anywhere in the back of our minds? Even what we believe about God, right? None of it means anything until we put them next to the word of God and we're testing our beliefs. And then also we test what God says because Christianity is a part of this big old conglomerate of beliefs that we're exposed to. Christianity is in that pot too with pantheism and theism, deism, all of that. All those things we have to reconcile. And when we test these things uh, by coming to God, or God comes to us, we can argue both ways, right? Then now we have a personal experience. So now it's not a theory, it's knowledge that I hold because I have an encounter with God. And when we're born again, then God actually dwells in us and our senses go up. Wait a minute, <laughs> let me advise you on that. Now we have an inner test that's automatic called the Holy Spirit. Sister Diane, you go ahead. So this is knowing that God, like when he speaks, um, when Jesus was talking to Peter and he's asking, who am I? And Peter says, I am the son of God. Or that, yeah, you are the son of God. That and then right. that's knowledge that Jesus said to Peter, God gave you that. So that's what right. knowledge is, is pretty much what God reveals to us. And if we're following God, that mm -hmm. we we he gives us the truth mm -hmm. and it affirms our faith and our belief yeah and that knowledge is what he has revealed to us yes yes indeed yes indeed very good very good and make sure y'all remember that one now let's walk this on home because i don't want to do what i did last week and keep y'all too late here is some good examples based on what we're studying in genesis 
Exodus chapter three, verse two, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed, right? So God here is confronting what Moses thought he knew. Now let's take a look at it from what we learned tonight about hermeneutics, about presuppositions. Moses thought that a bush is burning, it must be burned up. This didn't happen in a second. Moses saw it and he said, oh, ain't that something? That's burning pretty bright. And then he realized it's not going anywhere. So this is how God got Moses' attention, right? He got his attention and he drew him to himself. Would you say that is true? Say true or false? You don't even have to raise your hand. True. 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 Yes. So God challenged true. nature. What Moses assumed he knew all his life, God showed him something different. And he says, man, I got to find out what that means. And do you see that here? Moses believed that a bush must be burned up. The truth is, with God, all things are possible. Moses came to see, and now nobody can tell him anything different because he has firsthand knowledge of what God can do. Right? But it's just the beginning. Look at this. Moses started with a stick in his hand. And Pharaoh's people said, oh, there ain't no problem. We'll throw down our sticks too. Then Moses' stick ate their stick. That should have been enough right there. <laughs> right? <laughs> and yet we go through this long process. Do you see it here? Mm -hmm. Oh, y'all got y'all getting it now, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh -huh. You're getting how this works. God took them step by step. And I want you to know that all beliefs were challenged. All that they thought they knew about God, no matter what they were worshiping or whatever it is they thought that was mighty or in the pecking order, not just the Egyptians, but also the slaves. He challenged everyone's beliefs. Do you see it? Amen. Mm -hmm. I never seen uh, water turn to blood. No. Undrinkable. I never seen this many frogs in my life. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Look at these gnats. Flies. You mean you can turn, you could take a kingdom down with flies? Well, apparently so. <laughs> I'll cut off your food supply. You see how it's graduating. And then, you know, then the uh, boils, then the hail and the fire, then the locusts, which they had a little bit of that last year, then darkness, and finally, and all of this was refusing to adjust Pharaoh, Pharaoh refusing to adjust his belief system. No matter how much knowledge God gave him, he refused to change and adjust to what God showed him. You see that? And so then the, uh, the slaves, all they had to do was put the blood of an unblemished lamb over their doorposts and they were safe. Now he gets them out of Egypt, and now he's with them, right? He's a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Do you see now how he's challenging the macro, the meso, and the micro? They couldn't explain it. He said, we're hungry, and he gives them, what is it? Right? Manna. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it stopped me from being hungry. He's challenging their beliefs. You see it? So he's, he cools them off during the day and he gives them warmth at night. What Amen. is God saying to them? What is God telling them? That he's Trust looking me. after them. He's protecting them. He's taking care of them. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So it's Diane. God is calling them. Anything mm -hmm. to call them. Just like um, Sister Pam said, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a comfort to know that he's there. His presence is there it, beyond our imagination. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sister Parker. 
he is telling me that he is God and that there yeah. is no other. Is <laughs> anything too hard for God? Nothing. That's what the angel told Sarah. He had, mm. to, he had to check her. Mm. Amen. For 400 years, they were told that the son was God, right? <laughs> that there was another, there was a whole bunch of gods. There was one in the water, right? There was one in the frogs. You, you see where I'm going with this? There was a Lord of the flies. You see that? There was a snake God. There's a whole bunch of gods. There's a third eye, right? That's all this stuff they were told. And God systematically conquered all those other gods, whether they were gods or not. And then by continuing with them after parting the Red Sea, he's saying this one and making this one emphatic statement that the buck stops with me. If there were a bigger God, he would stop me from protecting you. But there is no other God. Very good, Sister Parker. Diane, go ahead. So then you come to the last uh, plague is when it's not one, it's death that they, mm -hmm. so it's almost like that points to Jesus. I'm not, yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does because we've all sinned just like Pharaoh. We're no better than him. God then told us a whole bunch of stuff we know we should have did. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit did not continue to strive with the Egyptians. He took, Pharaoh took it as far as you could take it, and he grieved the Holy Spirit. And so they received that, uh, not just a literal death, but a symbolic death uh, that, that pointed to, yes, what happens when you reject Christ. And that's why they had the blood of the lamb, unblemished lamb over their door. They had the Passover because that was a promise of how you are saved. The Hebrews weren't good people. I don't know who told y'all that. <laughs> they weren't no saints, so to speak. But it was the blood that saved them, not their goodness, not their actions, not their right doing, not their smarts. It was the blood of Jesus that saved them. Very good, uh, Sister Diane. All right, now this class is getting going. So now, after God has done all of this, right, they didn't even meet him till after they were delivered, right? And they met him from a distance. <laughs> after God has done all of this, now Moses can write to these people in the beginning. Imagine if God would have told him to write before they were delivered out of Egypt. Huh, think about that. You think they would have been open to receive that? Anyone? No, they would not have. Why not? Because they believed in other gods. Yeah. And the other, and the other gods they saw right before they died. They were winning. The mother gods were winning. They remained right. slaves for 400 years. If God had not came the way that he came, it would have been very difficult to receive the word of God. Any other comments on that? We're almost done. Go ahead, Diane. So that means they were believing in micro meso and yeah, there, yeah, <laughs> all those things that come with experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 As a matter of fact, if you mutter something else, you might get beat or worse. Right. Remember, they had their own crisis, their own time of trouble where every male child to and under was slaughtered. Remember that? Certainly seems like Pharaoh's gods were winning. So if Moses would have just came down and said, look, hey, man, I got this fantastic sermon. I'm going to open the doors of the church and I'm going to hand you all these Bibles. What would have happened? They would have turned to me in for the reward. Right. I heard there was a reward on you for killing an Egyptian. <laughs> and I'm about to get paid because their thinking could not expand to where God needed it to be in order to receive the word. Why would they believe that God made the heaven and earth if he can't even get me out of my situation? By the time Moses writes this, 
they're not questioning anything. They're like Peter. Somebody mentioned it. Peter, do you love me? Only knew you know, Lord, because he had seen so much that God can do. He knows. Don't even question God. If he says it, it, it is true. I don't even trust my own thinking and my own experience. Lord, you tell me what's true. You see it now? Everybody's quiet. Diane got thumbs up from Diane. Yes, and they have been crying out for how long? Yes. Before God came to deliver them. Yeah. Yeah. They have been crying out so long, Dr. Pam, that I'm sure the stories they heard about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob seem like a myth, like a bedtime story, and not true. It's like when somebody tells African Americans, you come from royalty. You're like, yeah, right. I'm going to go back to the hood. <laughs> you, know <what> I'm saying? <laughs> you know, it would be hard for people to, to, uh, to believe that when uh, it's been so downtrodden for so long. And I think that's a good comparison. Right? But, but here, here's God didn't just introduce himself to them then. He does it now. Romans 1.17. For therein is the righteousness of God, revealed from faith to faith. Diane said that earlier. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's the big challenge in it. Verse 19. Oh, go ahead, Diane. Jeez, I feel like I'm talking too much. Please forgive me. No, um, you're fine. You're fine. But um, it just reminds me of the time when Abraham was given the promise of that he was going to have nations and it was the time of when mm -hmm. abraham understood understood god's righteousness when he cut the animals in half and it wasn't abraham that went through the animals it was the flame of god that went through so it's mm -hmm. showing that all of this leads to a righteousness that we have to believe in in our god through mm -hmm. the beyond what we understand Amen. Well said. Well said. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest where? Amen. In them. For God has showed it unto them. Who is them? Everybody. He used a bush, a burning bush for Moses, but he used something else for you and something else for me. God makes himself known. Romans 1 19. Verse 20 of Romans 1, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So what is Paul saying in short? If you want to know if God is real, look back to the beginning. Look at creation as all of you have said so well uh, tonight by giving the different examples of the brain and, and different things like that and the seed and all of that, it is clear if we're open to see it. Okay, any final thoughts before we close it out tonight? Okay, Sister Hood, you's quiet tonight. I feel despised and rejected. <laughs> I thought for sure you was going to talk for me. But I think we had good participation uh, tonight. If there are no, oh, uh, Dr. Pam, go ahead. Yeah, it's so when we were talking about knowledge, the scripture that I read not too, well, I've been reading it, but I came more clear, which says, and I forget where it is, it says, to know God is to have eternal life. Mm -hmm. So the knowledge of God is to have eternal life. So how do you know God? How do you get to know God? That's our relationship that we have with him. And we continue to increase our knowledge of who God is throughout our lifetime. Amen. Okay, okay I'm looking, looking for it because I like that. All right. Oh, wait a minute. This is John, John 17, 3. John 17 and verse 3. 
Okay, John 17 and verse 3. And this is eternal life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. All right, Sister Audrey, go ahead. That was very good. Sister Audrey? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, you had your hand raised. Oh, I must have didn't take it down. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. Well, <laughs> if that is it, uh, we're going to have closing prayer. Anybody want to close us with prayer tonight? I'm sure that the people who watch on uh, afterwards, I'm sure they're going to enjoy this one. Anybody want to pray for us? I'll do it. Nobody else will. Oh, thank you, sir. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for the word you have given us on today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lord, we thank you for teaching us hermeneutics on tonight so that, God, we can know you better. Because, God, the better understanding we have, the more we get an understanding of your word, the closer we draw to you and you to us. So, God, continue to open up our minds and our hearts to be receptive unto you as you, you are instructing us in your word and as we read your word on our own. Because Lord, the one thing we want to do is to see your face in peace. So we ask these things, ask a blessing upon our past also for instructing this class and helping us to reach the goal that you have set before us. We give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' mighty and precious name, amen and amen. Amen, amen.